Homing, a winter poem dedicated to Thomas Transformer, and with an inscription, You shall carry up my bones from here, from Genesis. Tundra swans have come back from the frozen Arctic to the delta marshes where I, far from home, drawn by a view of the open sea and by the ancient future in the fantastic gospels of Jubal and Urthona, have spent my years building structures for that dawn, each poem a conduit from our irreplaceable present to a glimpse of odyssey towards a promised land. Structures I at last perceive amid the remnant of a tribe who have lost faith in themselves, seeing their hands stained with blood, their factory doors closing, their songbirds silenced, were mostly made of sand in a tidal area. But even at my age, sensing the sad range of human folly, my habits are entrenched. We are what we have become, still hoping to please my dead parents. I go on blindly building in the space created by wars as the tundra swans, inspired by the tilt of the earth, get ready to leave for the exact northern marshes where they were born. That was Peter Dale Scott, former Canadian diplomat and uh, UC Berkeley professor, poet and political researcher, reading not from his book named poem about the 1965 Indonesian massacre coming to Jakarta, but his new book, Tilting Point. And I'm Freeman Ng, I'm a former student, and we're taking a break from the Jakarta series to discuss uh, this new book. Well, um, uh, you begin this book with um, a personal poem. With this particular poem, I am actually dealing with the conflict between writing about the political and then being aware of the limits of what you can do with political poetry so that it's the tension between the political and the non-political are in this poem. It begins with um, a, a, an image of these uh, tundra swans. Once a year I go with my daughter. It's so funny you should ask because tomorrow I will go with my daughter to the Sacramento River Delta and they winter in the Sacramento Delta and they're there by the thousands and it's a very dramatic sight which very few city people in the Bay Area seem to think about mm. but it's very important to me. <clears throat> Part of me would like to go back to Canada where I come from and I won't do that but this, the tundra swans do it for me so to speak. I see that's their home. Right. <laughs> the well, what is their home? Their home is there and their home yeah. is here. And uh, it, they, it's true of me too. My home is Canada. My home is here in Berkeley, California. Only unlike the swans, I don't migrate once a year. <laughs> um, early in this poem, there's a reference to um, the fantastic gospels of Jubal and Orthona. I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> I expected you would ask me that. Jubal is one of the descendants of Cain in Genesis. And there's been actually quite a mythology about him, about he was, there are two of them, Jubal and Tubal Cain. And originally the poem was about the two of them and what they represent. Now Jubal is just there as something very odd and only very marginally meaningful from the book of Genesis, contrasted with Urthona, who is from the, what you might call the gospel poems of William Blake, because Blake also wrote in a kind of prophetic manner. And Orthona, uh, I should have reminded myself more, I think it's, he's one of the... I, I'm not going to embarrass myself by saying something wrong about Orthona, but he represents uh, <clears throat> the inspiration in modern poetry, and particularly Blake, who's a particularly prophetic figure, and, and imitates the style of the Gospels in his own poetry. Both, uh, the, both the Bible and 
particularly, uh, I don't know if we want to get into the quote from Genesis, but they, there's a vision of going home to a promised land. Actually, I will say a bit about the quote from Genesis. It's the instructions that Joseph gives to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Joseph gives to his children that he wants to be buried, not in Egypt where he is, but back uh, in the promised land. And uh, Blake is particularly appropriate here because his own poetry is inspired by the idea that England is not always going to be England of these dark satanic mills, but sometime we will continue to fight with my sword, sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. So it's the idea that where we are now, whether it's England or America or Canada, is a place, it's on its way to becoming something much better. And the promised land is, in the case of America, not geographically elsewhere, but the future that we have not yet created. And that idea is, as I once wrote elsewhere, not here, is just everywhere in the early writings of the um, the divines of New England or even the fathers of the American Revolution, they all saw themselves as on the way to a promised land. And you've uh, spent your life pretty much um, trying to work toward that. Building structures for that dawn, yes. Yeah. yeah. But well, may they turn out to be built of sand in a tidal area. Yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, Part of the idea of homing is that I'm going to die fairly soon. I'm 83, and uh, I have not built anything permanent that I can say we are now, because of this, closer to the promised land. Mm -hmm. I think it's been aspiration without much achievement. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense in which this poem, or maybe even this book, is... Um a kind of a final statement of, final summing up of things? Uh, well, talking about this poem, I would say definitely not. And I think probably the same is true of the book too. But in this poem, I'm almost on the contrary, I'm when I'm talking about a, a, the remnant of a tribe who have lost faith in themselves, seeing their hands stained with blood, I guess what I'm saying there is don't accept the fact that right now America has armies in foreign countries and is fighting silly wars in Iraq and so on, don't think that's the end of it. It isn't. You shouldn't lose faith in yourself. Uh, but on the same, on the other hand, um, we haven't got to the promised land either. So it's very open-ended in that respect. I just as I, I once had to give a, a, a sermon in a synagogue, and I said the, the book of Genesis ends in a very open-ended way because um, it's got this hope of a promised land, but it, the reality is they're still in Egypt. <laughs> and that's our reality in this world. So there's no nothing final about that. We're in process. Don't... Uh, be blinded by your faith in the future, but don't give up your faith in the future. Continue. Nevertheless, it's interesting in this poem that um, you go on doing what you've done all your life, but um, blindly, by habit. Right. Uh, I, I, I would like to think, I, I, I'm sure many people would read that as a kind of self-reproof, self-reproach, uh, still hoping to please my dead parents. Absurd, right? Uh, I go on blindly building in the space created by wars. I think I'm saying that that is the human condition. Uh, we don't know what we're doing, but we do it anyway. And then, is it a contrast or a comparison when I say, as the tundra swans, inspired by the tilt of the earth, get ready to leave or the exact northern marshes where they were born, a pessimist would say that the tundra swans know what they're doing, and I, being blind, don't know what I'm doing. But an optimist would say, 
each species does what it has to do. And the swans are doing what they have to do, and I'm just being a, another human being and doing what humans have to do. Well, move on uh, to really the, the meat of this book, which is a long, um, a long sequence of poems um, entitled Loving America. There are actually two poems, and, the, and they also balance each other. The first one, Loving America, and the second one, Changing North America. Hmm. We're not going to talk about that today, but I want people to know that that is how the book ends. And I am positioning myself not in that section, not as a Canadian poet, not as an American poet, but as a North American poet trying to see both countries at once. Well, throughout the poems, um, you, you struggle to find ways in which poetic or artistic voices can have a positive effect on the world. Right. And you, you present many examples, some, some figures who, are, who, are, who, who were not able to accomplish as much as they might have because of certain structural flaws, I guess you could call them. Uh, Ginsburg, for example. Right, or Whitman. Even. Or Whitman, even, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and others that, um, others that had these moments of transcendence. Uh, the the, the Leonard Cohen um, example, for example. Right, when yes. Was, well, by the way, I think Ginsburg and Whitman also had moments mm -hmm. of transcendence, but they were constrained in what they wanted to do by their limitations. And the, the same with, with, with Leonard, you know, that he has his... I give a moment of transcendence, but I'm aware of it, and he's aware. I mean, that's very much Leonard's style, is to be aware of his limitations. Mm -hmm. um, all this is sort of a struggle to accomplish, uh, to sort of heed, follow the call of, um, of Miloš. Um, you quote some lines of his about, yes. about poetry in the world. Uh, Miloš wrote, gave some lectures at Harvard the witness of poetry, and he said that in every era the task of the inspired poet is to transcend his paltry ego and remind the soul of the people of the open space ahead. In these cycles you you grapple with that that challenge. You uh, you grapple with um, uh, the, the contradictions and um, uh, inconsistencies of America, the good and the bad, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it kind of comes uh, to a point in the, in the poem that I'd like us to read next. Um, Which is the last in the sequence of Loving America. Right. The poem is entitled Remembering Denise and People's Park, and before I begin, <clears throat> I'll just say that Denise is Denise Levertov, who's I think a very important, underestimated British-American poet, uh, whom I knew quite well at the time of People's Park, which was here in Berkeley back in 1969, when uh, in the midst of the anti-war struggles, uh, a group of young people uh, took a, an abandoned lot, which the university was not doing anything with, and intended to turn into a parking lot in the short run, and they made a, a garden there, or started to make a garden, and this was a challenge to the university's sense of property. That's ours, not yours, we'll see this. And so um, we had annual protests in that era back in Berkeley, and that year was People's Park. Denise, in that remote era when it was a tribal custom for friends, and sometimes even strangers, to kiss each other on the mouth, each of us became entranced by People's Park. When you, as enthusiastic as Miranda, wrote of what could be our new world, and I, of when a landscape gardener sodded over Dwight Way and people danced barefoot to music from Joy of Cooking on a flatbed truck, where Elle danced bare-breasted in front of the impassive National Guard inside the park, bayonets fixed to their rifles. 
Bliss was it in that dawn, I wrote later, that dawn. Was there ever such a dawn not followed swiftly by bayonets or the guillotine? And yet I sensed it. I cannot help what I have sensed. Even though that same day Tom Hayden and Bernadine Dorn, who had said offing those rich pigs with their own forks and knives far out the weatherman dig Charles Manson, tried and failed to steer our march off track into mayhem. And Elle told me afterwards she danced bare-breasted only because Mike Delacour, the organizer, came up behind her and ripped off her bra. Even so, I defended People's Park at an emergency session of the Berkeley Academic Senate, much to the pleasure of the students, but even more to the dismay of my erstwhile friend Miłosz. None of us knew what we were thinking still entranced by the fantasy that we could be free and the rumors of no law I sensed in the sea breeze when surrounded on the beach by hundreds of naked adolescent strangers. How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. And by policemen on horseback who could do nothing there were so many of us. We were all entranced in that era by the hope of a great change. The New York Review had on its cover a how-to diagram of a Molotov cocktail, and our local tabloid carried a map of the electrical grid showing unprotected pylons in remote parks. A revolution with nothing to replace it, leading once again, I feared, to masses starvation. When I read your book to stay alive, went with some of my students to work in People's Park to shovel up the garbage, in those days I found it incoherent, with lines in it I did not like, any more than Creeley or Duncan did, as when you rebuked Judy Collins, a time when only anger is love. I remember at a dinner, you spoke of Berkeley's third world strike, how the police clubbed the picketers. And I said, but some of the picketers were using clubs too, Denise, with nails in them. After which, with much silence, your response to your, was to your husband, well, what do you think, Mitchy? leading our English department host to comment later, compassion, that woman has the compassion of a turtle. I thought your politics naive. Not very different from your childhood days when you handed out the daily worker with a faith in revolution and no clear idea of where it would lead. Like the revolutions of Russia and China, followed by murderous starvations, especially of innocent peasants. But in truth, I was naive too about that brave new world in which my daughter Cassie, aged 10, disappeared for a few terrifying minutes under the strobe lights of the Avalon into a cavern of patchouli and incense smoke to the music of Country Joe and the Jefferson Airplane, till I found her in a half-lit corner with other small children, her face being painted. Denise, that was not a revolution to which we could entrust our children. There were new words you did not list in relearning the alphabet, like chlamydia. My marriage, like yours, broke up. But when she, whom you called Helen Venom, excluded you and Duncan and Ginsburg, all anti-war poets, from her Harvard book of contemporary poetry, Miłosz, whom you called your master, forgiving your politics, as he never quite did mine, discovered your work in Evening Train and translated it into Polish. 
Then I began to discern how both Creeley, with his grimace of distaste for Rilke, and Duncan, she appears Kali dancing, whirling her necklace of skulls, had neither of them the caliber to appreciate you when you outgrew Black Mountain. So I reread To Stay Alive, looking not just at its chips of stone, but at the larger design, and saw for the first time the integrity of Hopkins and Keats in the manner of Whitman and the Pisan Cantos, with your recapitulation of your earlier life, reprinting your poems to your sister to illustrate your incoherence from being straddled between places and its processive pentimento, only anger is love. I wrote it, but knew such love only in flashes, so that what was once condemned as bad confessional verse seems now like a mind collecting and purifying itself. Am I still incoherent? Very well, I am incoherent. After all, Walt Whitman, the country is incoherent. Friendly, generous, for the most part tolerant, but perhaps too dutiful to a government that is also generous and at the same time murderous. The only government we have haunted by our sense of the certainty we must do better than this. Looking back on that period, looking back on that period and People's Park in particular, what, what, how do you see them? What, what were they in, you know, in the life of our society? Well, America is always being a place of um, experiments for the future, going back to the Shakers, you know, uh, and uh, uh, California in particular housed all kinds of utopian communities in the 19th century and 20th century, and certainly in the 1960s, Berkeley was filled with communes and all kinds of experiments and alternative living. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, there was not as much inspiration behind the idea of people's part as I thought there was at the time. I mean, I really was interested in it. Denise was really interested in it. I think it was a blind alley, and I, th I would now reprove not all of the organizers, but one of them in particular, I don't need to name names, who I think really did it as a provocation. They did it because they knew the university won't like this, they'll call in the police, there'll be trouble, uh, maybe somebody will get killed, and somebody did get killed. Um, and. One of the things that I most regret now about the, what happened in time to the anti-war movement was that it became dominated by people, and I, na I do name two names, names here, here, Tom Hayden and Bernadine Dorn, who, who were provocative because they figured that history proceeded dialectically, and if, you, if they got the march, the march was approved for a certain route. They tried to get the march to go by a different route, knowing the police would come in, break heads, and in their feeble minds, this would radicalize a lot of people and lead America even closer to a revolution. Nonsense. Per pernicious, deadly nonsense. Partway through this, uh, this poem, you, 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 you begin to shift your view of Denise. You, you begin to broaden your view of Denise. I would say it's going back and forth all the way through. Oh. At the time, I, I loved her, you know, she was, uh, she was an incredible person. Um, but I loved her didn't mean I had to love her politics, you know what I mean? Yes, I thought she was naive. Um, 
So you, you tell me how you see a shift, because I think the biggest shift is that I didn't like the books that she wrote in the middle of the anti-war movement. Nobody did. Everybody attacked them, and I attacked them. And her friends, her closest friends, Creeley and Duncan, attacked them. But I now see that what she was doing was working through something and letting all the shit hang out. Mm. Um, and uh, that's how you should read those books, is her working through something. And she became, in the end, a Roman Catholic convert and uh, a religious poet. That's what Miwash admired about her. And I admire the whole process of her life. All her poetry is one poem, re leading to the final products that she wrote up in uh, Seattle, looking at Mount Rainier, and usually just seeing clouds and every now and then a glimpse of the summit. And, um, and uh, so I see that now, but didn't see it at the then. So in that sense, yes, I right. changed. I it see hadn't... her much more approving of her as a poet now than I was then. Well, I'd like to uh, uh, return now to um, the personal. Okay. and end with um, a poem that was actually, uh, I guess, a late addition to the book, a, a last-minute addition to the book. Right, uh, yes. Um, is there any particular story around it being added to the book so late? Well, it was, I didn't write it for the book. I wrote it uh, because I didn't have a poem for my poetry group. But by the time I'd finished it, it had the word tilt in it. And um, the, the, the homing poem that we read at the beginning... Yeah leads off the short poems with a, with the swan sensing the tilt of the earth. Mm. And my first thought, my first idea of a title for the book was actually Sensing the Tilt, mm. that we should be like the swans. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, my publisher suggested as a title Tilting Point, but he really meant to say tipping point. It was his unconscious that said <laughs> tilting point. I, I've said on a, with you on another occasion that coming to Jakarta came from my right. subconscious. I had intended to write Come, Jakarta is coming, right. which is what the CIA used to t scare people in Chile. The subconscious was better. Mm -hmm. And I told my publisher, Paul Portuguese, who's a, a poet too, a good one, I, I said to him, your subconscious was right and you were wrong. It shouldn't be tipping point. It's not a programmatic poem about, you know, what to do next about America. It's about something that's beyond the rational. So that there's a, a tilting point in a third sense here in this poem, Apples, which is the tilt of my quixotic lance that I'm tilting at the mills of state with. So, yes, there was a reason to work that in. Apples. The apples just outside my window are already past their prime. And I have only eaten about six, all of them with honey at the Jewish New Year. I didn't make applesauce as I used to love to do. I didn't even bring a bag to the food kitchen in People's Park. And there's not much else to show for my industry either. Tilting at the mills of state with a lance of paper. Once again, this will be on my conscience when, in two or three months, the apple limbs will be bare and already, right beside them, the star magnolia petals will once again begin to fall. <laughs>